The following program is underwritten by the Nevada Irrigation District. Since 1921, providing clean and healthy drinking and irrigation water to more than 24,000 homes, farms, schools, and businesses in Nevada and Placer counties. Sitzer, your host for Nevada County Interviews. We have a uh, wonderful guest uh, this evening, uh, George Cloud, local artist and old friend, uh, who moved here in the early 70s was when I met George and was incredibly impressed with his artwork at that time, which was uh, over 30 years ago. And George has continued to do his work throughout his life. And I've been threatening to, um, to uh, show it to the world, which uh, he beat me to it because uh, he is now uh, having his first exhibit that I know of uh, to, uh, at Center of the Arts going on this, uh, this week. Uh, and, and so I want to introduce George to everyone. George, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Lou. It's, um, it's great to be here and I'm, I'm honored. And um, it is exciting to finally be exposing myself like this and I should have known you would do this to me, so I've, I've been <laughs> anticipating it. Uh, yeah, so. George has has um, sort of um, hidden in the shadows uh, of wonderful work, uh, and I'm so pleased that you've brought it out for everyone to see. Um, the exhibit uh, at Center of the Arts is from uh, June 9th. It's begun until what date? The 28th, through the 28th. So, so. everyone will be able to see it uh, there. <laughs> Uh, until the 28th, and so I encourage you to do that. Uh, but we have a lot of images to look at today, and I want to encourage us to move on. So, George, I know that um, your life has been devoted to art, and it started at an early age, so if you could give us an indication of what got you interested, and then we'll move on to the images. Well, I was, um, I was fascinated by by book illustrations when I was a kid, actually. That's what really got me into drawing and the, fan the fantasy of imagery, and um, that it was the one thing I, it was the one thing that I really loved to do was draw pictures and make up stories about them. And um, and then as I you know I would I had a lot a very quiet home. My parents were much older than most people's parents, and it was a very settled place. And um, I just spent a lot of time drawing and making up stories about my these little drawings that I would do and um, and I became known in my class as the the artist guy you know so that's just what I love to do more than anything else so um, I've continued with that and that's how that's how it all started and you so. you received a master's of arts at um, San Jose State College yes. in, in 1970 I earned a master's degree in art and and this show goes well, is a retrospective, and it is, goes back to my, the, my, my graduate work at San Jose State. And so the earliest, uh, it go, it's yeah. about a 39-year retrospective. retrospective is so let's take a look at the first now, image. So. Uh, and I know we, uh, th this goes back to when you were working uh, uh, as a student at uh, San yes. Jose State. Mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. So this is a, a lithograph. I was working in the print printmaking department, and this is a very significant image in my personal iconography. It was, um, it was really where I first found my voice and my style, although I can't define what this style is, except I th I'm, I've been fascinated by symbolism, and this is uh, one of my 
symbolist <laughs> images. I, I think of this early time, the, you know, when I first found, found this as sort of my um, visionary, mystical, cosmic period, you know. So, so you have the ocean, clouds, a shell, the moon. Uh -huh. Yes. And, um, and it's entitled Mystic Moonshell, and it was... Um, it's just a very, very personal in terms because it, when, with this image, I really felt like I had found my style somehow. Um, you know, at that point. So, excellent. Yeah. Here we go with some more clouds. This is a, a pen and ink drawing, and it is called the Revelation. It was. Um, this was actually. I was pretty good at clouds, as you you know, and so I was doing a lot of clouds and I kind of identified them. Perhaps being young as I was, maybe my head was in the clouds too, I'm not sure. But this was actually inspired by having a one person exhibit at the Crocker Art Museum back in 1971. And I felt like I was being shined upon somehow. I was emerging from behind this mass of land and, and this, you know, this sun was shining down on me and I thought perhaps I was on my way to fame and fortune but that didn't prove to be the case however I, I got a kind of a good drawing out of it <laughs> so it's nice it's, uh, it's nice to know that you have exhibited before yes uh, but it's been a long time and here's another uh, what I call a symbolic landscape um, this is called the captive once again you see there's that cloud there and this was Shortly after I had graduated from, from college and I was working in a job that I didn't really like that much and so I felt like I was captive and that's, so that is the reason that cloud is captured in, that, you know, in those uh, mountains like that and wishing to be up, uh, up floating in the sky once again. So, and I noticed that yeah. this is probably <clears throat> colored pencil? Yes, it's colored pencil. So you um, moved from uh, yeah. a different forms of uh, art to pencil foremost? It's, yes, I've tried different, you know, I, I did lithography for printmaking, which is very much like drawing. And I also did just, just graphite pencil. I didn't do very much color, but I did break into color. I felt somewhat uncomfortable with color for the longest time, but um, I finally did, did work with that, you know. And, it seems to be more dynamic, dy dynamic having color in my pieces. So anyway, I moved after college. I moved to um, Nevada City, and I bought property with some dear friends, Diane and Ralph Federley, and they and two other friends founded the Foothill Theater Company. And suddenly, my life was inundated with all these theatrical types and all this theater activity, and I was seduced by this. And for the next 13 years, most of my artistic energy was given to theater, including doing most of the posters for Foothill and painting and building sets. And um, so there's a wall of my posters in this exhibit. Of not all of the posters I did, surely, but um, a good sampling of them. This is one for the Beggar's Opera, which was actually uh, a production that was done in conjunction with Music in the Mountains. and. It kind of, you know. I'm particularly so. struck with this one because of the perspective. One would never think of a drawing looking up <clears throat> at a horse and rider. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Again, the tree, the moon in the background is very dramatic. And I'm wondering how you come upon this sort of a thought. Well, well this was, you know, this image is a kind of um, an homage to my favorite book illustrators. It's somewhat reminiscent of the, those great great illustrators like Howard Pyle, N.C. Wyeth, who were able to um, just create those, you know, dramatic points of view, which makes, makes it much more interesting to, you know, than just a straight on. So it, make, it adds to the drama, you know, and that was a conscious attempt there. This is a poster I did for Amadeus. Um, it actually wasn't the official poster. It was a commemorative poster that I did because at this point, another poster maker came on, you know, became, started taking, doing the uh, posters for Foothill. But I had this design that I really wanted to do and I was printing these posters myself as silkscreen. I really wanted to do this one. So I printed it and put it out there as just a commemorative poster. And I, you know, anyway, it was a, 
It's, it's a, a beautiful, personal project. It's a striking yeah, right. poster, so, and uh, you know the subtleties uh, yeah. of Amadeus. Uh, in gold and the Foothill Theatre Company insignia on the bottom. I mean, uh, the subtleties are just so wonderful, and as well as the detail. Thanks. This is a um, poster. Actually, I did this for Garbo's Dinner Theatre. Um, I just like the whimsy of it, and it's a Noel Coward play, and it was. Uh, it's sort of an Art Deco feel to it. It's. Um, I, the one thing I liked about po doing posters is that it was an attempt, it was, my work was out there on the street and it was an attempt to grab the eye and I would always try to try to do something that would, um, you know. It was, a very, it was a very see. public way of showing yes, yourself. Right. Yes, and, and, and for a while there I was quite exposed, you know, unlike the past 10 years or so. Anyway, mm -hmm. So people thought of me as a poster artist and I, I was pleased doing that. It was lots of fun. It was, the, the street was my, was my gallery. So. Very creative, and it sort of puts you on a schedule so. in the sense that you couldn't take that long. I mean, often your uh -huh. art pieces are uh -huh. long in, uh, mm. in creating, uh -huh. but we'll talk about that when we get to them. And this is uh, one of my favorite posters for Waiting for Godot, which is also one of my favorite plays. And um, it just came together so easily, unlike so many of the images I struggled with, I just, uh, anyway, I was very pleased with this, and also, I happened to be in this play, I played the part of Lucky, um, it was a very exciting <laughs> adventure, this whole... And I think that image comes up later in yes, your you'll work. Yes, you'll, you'll see, see you'll see, you'll see my end. <laughs> what I love uh, about this is, is the simplicity of it, uh -huh. the striking simplicity. Right. And here was another, another style poster, another attempt to grab the eye. It was a great fun production. It was a, a farce, and it was, you know, I just, this is what came of that. And are you still so, doing, were you still doing, printing those yourself? Yes, I was. I had, a, I had set up a silk screen um, printing, you know, serograph thing in my studio, and I was printing these. Well, you know, right. myself. And this is what you note as your theater period <coughs> when you right. were occupied for 13 years mm -hmm. doing, uh, doing theater posters. Yes. It's great. I love the color. And then after theater, my theater period, I wanted to get into a more personal expression once again. And I couldn't, I couldn't, I didn't really want to return to my cosmic mystical period. I wasn't there anymore. That was my youth in a way. I needed to find another personal imagery, other, something more that reflected my, you know, me as I, as I was at, you know, at this time. So I decided to investigate imagery from my dreams. And I did a series, I spent about seven years just working with those. This is one of those. It's, um, it's called Rescue Discovery. And it was um, a dream in which I was rescuing people drowning in the ocean. And in another part of the dream, I was walking beside the ocean and found a pyramid made of sand. I lifted it up and inside there were these riling, this, this, <laughs> this Ro rolling bunch of eels. It was rather alarming and, and upsetting. It was sort of about facing, looking at the subconscious and about s saving parts of yourself. And so that's, you know, that's, this, uh, yeah. that was that one. And this is a larger drawing than you would think uh, on the screen. What size is it about? It's about um, 20 by 24 or so, you know. And the detail like is yeah. extraordinary. Yeah. So right. uh, do right. think about going to see the exhibit mm -hmm. because you get things that you wouldn't, you, you'll see much more detail than you will on a TV screen. Here's another dream image in which um, initially it was just a, a, a large elephant was standing there and, it, and um, it just felt so powerful. And later on I was riding my bicycle through the forest, I came upon a man who's, whom I talked to, an older man, and he said he was very proud of me. He was, you know, he thought I was on the right path, and I, it, this felt good, and I suddenly realized that this was my father, who actually was, was not that supportive of my artistic endeavors. And here, finally, I met my father in a dream, and he said everything was good. And, and later on, I was riding my bicycle through the forest once again, and I saw my father struggling through this forest, and I realized 
I'm so happy that I'm on this bicycle. I, I did choose the right path. And that's, you know, so that, that drawing is called Into the Woods, and it's very personal in that way. Here's another drawing. This was not entirely a dream, but part of it was inspired by a dream, and in which I had found, I had a boat, a model boat that was on a shelf. I, I went on, I climbed up onto my ladder to look at it, and I discovered that the bowsprit had broken. The bowsprit is the long, um, tapered uh, nose nose of the of the boat, and. Um, this happened just about, a t this was after I decided I was tired of doing dreams and I, n I had to, I wanted to go on to other imagery and I suddenly was, I wasn't able to find, you know, the inspiration. And so I lost my way for a while there. And this image is about being that, being lost there um, for a while, having lost my, my bowsprit, so to speak. Um, and there's, a, it, there's an, a, ro a rose in the background, as you can see. I use the rose frequently in, in some of my images before. That's a personal image. There's also, a, I borrowed an image from one of my favorite uh, artists, Albrecht Dürer. It's the, it's the famous uh, angel from his, his print called um, Melancholy. So this was about a, a time of struggle and trying to find my, my way. And um, so... Here is a, an image called For Linda, and this is uh, inspired by my wife, Linda, who is a photographer and who was working with imagery with, her, with a pinhole camera for a uh, number of years there. And, it was, um, and this is her beside the ocean holding her pinhole camera with a, a number of props surrounding her. There's also an image of, of me and her as young children sitting, because she wanted me, when I was working on this, she said, well, I, I don't want this just to be about me. You should be in there too. So I, I, I did an image of me and, and she as children in the background. Um, so it's... Then after a while, I decided I really wanted to get into some color, and I also wanted. I, I was finally I broke through, you know, from from that time of the bro broken bow spirit. I finally I went to an exhibit at the Palace of the Legion of Honor. It was a surrealist exhibit. I believe it was called the Eye of Desire. It was on. It was a traveling exhibit from the Jewish Museum, and I was just. I was really inspired by this exhibit, and it offered, it sort of um, showed me that I could do virtually anything I want. I, I wasn't necessarily confined to dreams or whatever. So um, I started playing with any image that fascinated me, and this was the first image that came out of that. And I was fascinated by this heart. It was in, actually, I saw this heart in a National Geographic, and I drew it, and then I started putting elements surrounding it. and. Um, I, I borrowed images, I, you know, I guess you, you can call it appropriation, some people call it stealing, but I, yeah, I really loved this group of men in, the, in this um, painting by El Greco. It was, I think they are uh, apostles of Christ, and the painting is the miracle of Christ healing the blind. So I stuck them back there, and they're looking at the heart going, wow, look at that, you know, because I think the heart is a miraculous wise organ, you know, it, um, it, it, it is the seat of wisdom as well as the mind, you know. And then I, I love this image of these children in this um, movie theater. They were just, they're just capt captive spellbound. with the spellbound. And yeah. this, this, um, this image is entitled World of Wonders. I also, up in the upper left, is a part of a, draw, a painting by one of my favorite surrealists, but his name is uh, Giorgio de Chirico. This is one of my favorite works of his, a part of it called Mystery and Melancholy of a Street. And then I've thrown in other, other symbols because I'm really, this, this period is what, that I'm in now, I think of as symbolism run amok, is what I call it. And so I, I'm free to just add, to put anything in there that fascinates me and hope that it, you know, it looks as if it has meaning, and that's what I like. I like it to look as though it means something, even though I don't necessarily know what it means. And sometimes, eventually, it does reveal itself. Here's another of my symbolism run amok, showing my fascination with pirates. Um, this was inspired by just a vision of 
Icarus falling into the pirate sea. And um, I just started playing with that image and put other things around. Uh, there's Icarus in, up in the upper right. There's, uh, I also wanted some dynamism in happening in there. So I have this locomotive passing through there. I think this is entitled The Inevitability of Impetus. And it's about that need to go out there and do it, you know, to go for the piratic quest or whatever, you know. And, uh, down in the up lower left, there's an apple with a bite out of it. Of, um, that is the famous apple of the, you know, of the, you know, the fall apple. of man, so-called. Um, yeah. um, and other I images, you know, when I, after I had finished this, I, I needed something behind that apple. It looked so lonely, so I found a cross-section of a hurricane to stick behind there in National Geographic. I have 40 years' worth of National Geographic that I pour over looking at pictures. Uh, it's a great source of imagery. So. Right. And I, I do want to mention to everyone that uh, this is uh, George Cloud, uh, who is exhibiting his uh, work, uh, a retrospective at Center of the Arts, until the 28th of this month. So be sure to go there. You'll see much more detail than you will uh, viewing things on TV. So let's go back to that next image. <laughs> ah, yeah. and here we come back to waiting for Godot. This is a, a drawing that I that is entitled how to make a drawing if you're lucky and it it shows me performing the role of lucky that is that figure there to the right um, and it is <laughs> surrounded by all kinds of symbolism that uh, you know up in the upper left there are two angels that are holding a scan of the brain before and during prayer this is the, the artist praying praying for inspiration you know up above Lucky is a triangular shape called a tri-bar. This is the simplest uh, shape that can be drawn but cannot be reproduced uh, in, re in physical reality. It's, a, it's an illusion, in other words. It's like an M.C. Escher image. And it, this is part of what is the, I consider the power of being, of being able to draw. You know, you can create illusions like that. Um, and then um, there's... Other <laughs> can we? Uh, yeah, you know, we'll go, go back, back to it. There's. Uh, I, I'm also fascinated with anatomical drawings. I just love being, you know, the fact that you can look inside the human body like that. That artists can, you know, that this is a possibility. So in the center there is a the cross section of a, um, a head with revealing the skull and the spine, and it is emerging from an ocean. That is the artist, uh, and he's holding it. A pencil coming out of the ocean, and he is drawing this whole piece, you know. And so, it's um, sort of, I, it's just sort of. <laughs> well, it, it's very impressive kind of. in its in its complexity. Uh -huh. um, and how long I, people need to appreciate right. the, the the time and scrutiny. In artistry, how long does it take you to produce a work like it this? It takes me months. You know, it takes months to just uh, put the, together all the images to find, you know, to find the ones that I want to play with, and then to actually lay them out. And then the final rendering takes you know, a good amount of time. Also, it's it's very detailed and very, you know. Very boring to watch, I'm sure, you know, but it's, uh, but it's... Well, you know, when you get it to this point and you can see really so much of you in it and so much of uh, sort of the state of the world as well, uh, picking up the imagery. So this is another of my symbolism run amok. It's called Chaos and Carnations. And up in the upper left is a, the image, an image that I found in a book by Carl Jung called Psychology and Alchemy. And it is... Call, it was a, actually a black and white engraving, and I, I, put, I drew it in color, and it is a, a cauldron of uh, the cosmos, in a way, of the, of the earth, fire, water, and all these things, just mix, mixing it up together, along with little images of, of astrological signs battling each other. And he said, the, he called this the... Um, unfettered opposites in chaos and he said uh, you know chaos is the prima materia this is from which everything comes and I, I was just fascinated by it so I drew it there and then I needed another image so I found a, a 
an image in the National Geographic once again, uh, and this one is right that circular image right to the right of the chaos, which is actually a human ovum being atta being attacked by sperm, which is also a prima materia I consider. You know, it, it, and then I saw the found these two wonderful birds in a, a botanical or a, um, uh, an, in a print by a, uh, an artist similar to Audubon, except he was Australian. Um, and it's, as it happens, I just love the way these birds are sharing a snake. There's a lot of couple things happening in this, you know, what with um, the sperm and the egg and the, and the couple, you know, the couples in the astrological thing and the birds and such, yeah. So. There's so much to cover, right. and uh, this is the last <laughs> illustration, <laughs> so we can spend a few minutes on it. Okay. <coughs> Finally, we come to this, which is called Arrival, or Legend in His Own Mind. And once again, we come back. Well, this is an autobiographical, talismanic image. And um, it's in the upper left there, you see, there is, we return to my, my first image, which was so important to me, of the mystic moonshell. And it is, in the background is uh, Nevada City, and floating in the sky is my mystic moonshell. And I'm coming up over a hillside overlooking Nevada City, also floating in the sky. To the right there is Good Fortune, whom I stole from Albrecht Dürer also. And I'm coming onto this hillside where a, an agave plant is growing, which is also known as a sentry plant. And dancing around the sentry plant are these nine women who are the nine muses. And so I, this is sort of... A, a, the hope that I am, the century plant is a symbolic of hopefully my being a late bloomer and being continuously inspired by the muses. Then down on the bottom, we see my influences as a child, which the, the things that really inspired me to start drawing, which happened to be Dick Tracy. And um, Dick Tracy is shooting a villain here, as you can see. And then somehow a magician or an alchemist is, cha you know, is changing the bullets into rays of inspiration, which are hitting me as a child floating in ecstasy with a shower of pencils around me. <laughs> well, I, <It's>, <laughs> I, I'm amazed, George, so, that we've been able to cover this much at, <laughs> at uh, this time. And because uh, it's, you're getting uh, George's life uh, uh, in 27 minutes. <laughs> And uh, I hope you've gotten enough of a taste of it that you will uh, go see the show um, at the Center for the Arts. It's, uh, it'll be there until the 28th. Uh, it's an incredible show. And I want to thank um, the entire crew here, um, uh, Cassandra Wallstrom, uh, Ryan Little, Michael Lamarca, our executive director, um, Gail Woodman, Marilyn Blom, Jenna Remley, a wonderful crew all volunteering to bring this show here to you um, uh, at NCTV and to let you know that we're also uh, streaming on the web. You can watch us on the internet. And uh, I want to thanks, thank you a lot. Tune in again. And thank you, George. Thank you, Lou. It's been great. And what, a, what a great way to celebrate our lives.